Um, all right, so we want to welcome you to church, but before I jump in, our theme this morning is the donut theology, okay? I'm a professional, I studied for many years, and so I get this best slogan ever, okay? I'm not even going to charge you royalties if you quote this, okay? But we're going to talk about there is power in the flower. I'm a professional, you can trust me. Uh, no, seriously, it's just going to get worse from here on. But okay, okay this, this is going to be the best part. The donut theology, there's power in the flower. But before I start preaching, I need to just welcome Tanitina. Um, you, some of you might even know Auntie Tina. She's a very, very special lady. When, when I got to meet her, I was slightly younger than I am now. I was about 13 years old, 14 years old. And um, she was part of my dad's previous church in Hansby. And Man, it was amazing. My dad ran successful connect groups back then, okay? But to him, it was connect groups. But to Auntie Tina, it was MasterChef SA. Okay, so I just want to mention what happened, right, man? We, Leandro and myself, okay, I was saved. Leandro was um, um, going to church with me. And so what happened was we, we, would, we would have to go to connect groups on Wednesday evenings. And we, Leandro never wanted to go with. Okay, I always wanted to be there. And she never went to go with. But when we heard that Connect Group is by Tani Tina's house tonight, ladies and gentlemen, you even don't do your homework that afternoon. You don't eat and you focus on going to Master Chef plane by. In any case, it was fantastic. And Tani Tina, we just want to say a warm welcome. It's wonderful having you here. Um, she had a special place in my dad's heart. And I can't tell you guys why. It's got something to do with Tani Tina got, getting a big fright in a public place. And the rest, I can't tell you. That's for personal consumption. So we just want to say a warm welcome, Tanitina. Great to have you with us this morning. I'm going to talk to you about the donut theology, but we're going to start off with a conspiracy theory. I wish I had a sound like dun, dun, dun. But okay, I'll just make this sound myself, okay? A conspiracy theory. It's going to start off with this slide. Yes. Okay. Six. Now, that might not mean much, but it depends in what context you are. When you're at a cricket field, okay, that's significant. Okay, that's significant. <laughs> I'm just going to say it. I apologize in advance, okay? <laughs> if you choose your wife, and, and she's a six out of ten, it's still a good thing because she's got a fantastic personality, okay? She's got a fantastic personality. So, so I mean, what, what you guys are going to feel here with a six is, is completely up to you, okay? So the, the context of the numbers can change in certain situations. It can be good in a cricket field, and it can be good when you're married as well, okay? Now, when I add a number to this, okay, there's another six, okay? Now, that might not mean much, Unless you're old, okay? Then, then a six and a six together can be nice because you probably retired a year ago. You've been playing a lot more golf. You have been not seeing your husband so much because he's also out doing something else. So there's peace in the home. There's no drama. Your, your, your pension is still full by this time, hopefully, okay? There's, it, I mean, this is probably the most you're going to have, okay? <laughs> Just going to get worse from here. But okay, so, so six and a six together, okay, okay. But something scary happens when I do this. And I add another six, ladies and gentlemen. Now, now, now. You will notice that this conspiracy theory goes so deep, it changes the atmosphere, okay? The moment I added another six, you guys became a little bit nervous and jittery. Did you, can you feel the atmosphere change? It's not the air cons, okay? It's the atmosphere changing. So the moment we have three sixes in a row, man... I was raised in a church where if you had a cell phone with that number, you burn your phone, ladies and gentlemen. If your ad address, you stayed at this place, you clean your house, you burn your house. You're not even allowed to sell your house. You give it free to the church and you run away from the house. And they will sell it because it's holy money. Anyways, so when you add these sixes together, it becomes very... Whoa. Okay, if you guys don't know what I'm talking about, in church theology, the number 666, it's a big no, 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 no. Especially when you read about Revelation. But now it begins a little bit odd, okay? Because now I'm going to add a name to the six, okay? And the name is going to be John, okay? Now, now, it, it, 
I'm, guys, I'm not making this up, okay? I'm a professional. You can trust me, okay? Really, you can look at the, If you've got your Bibles, you've got to open your Bibles at John C. The oddest thing stands at this verse, okay? It's the strangest idea. It's probably the most shocking verse I have ever read in the... I'm not even making this up. This is the... It's, it's concerning. And the chance is that it's by a triple C... Oh, it's, it's getting scary, okay? Getting scary. Are you guys ready for this verse? No, you guys are not ready for this verse, but it's fine. It's fine, okay? You guys are reading it already. Stop! <laughs> stop! Okay, stop. Look at me, look at me, look at me, look at me. If you're online, look. He's all, he's all, okay. This is a real verse, okay? Listen to what it says. And after this, many of his disciples turned back and no longer walked with him. Okay. So, uh, yes. Do you feel the atmosphere? Ooh, okay, it's like something, something bad is about to happen. It's good, but it's bad, okay? It's badly good. I, I don't know what you want to call it, okay? The point just being is, in this scripture verse, Jesus did something so significant, so crazy. He said stuff so weird that people left his church. Why are you guys so quiet? Okay. It's, it's odd. Okay. And, and this is a strange thing. Okay. This is a strange thing. Because when, when we go to church conferences, they talk about, you know, when you're a good pastor, things will expand and grow. And that's, it's only the big churches that usually say that. And they say, it's fantastic. And then I get this weird verse at John 6, verse 66. And it says, and when Jesus was done, a lot of people walked away from him. Now, if that verse is odd, what stands before this verse will explain to you why this is so a little bit weird. Okay, but we have to go a couple of verses back first. Okay, so I'm going to talk to you for one second about the pretext. Now, if I can give you one tip, and this is probably the biggest tip that can I can ever give anyone when you study the Bible, is point that that was the tip. You study the Bible, okay? And so what it means, you need to look at this, this, this whole story, what took place to this, because it explains to us what is happening here. So the first couple of verses in this, in this chapter speaks about Jesus feeding the 5,000, okay? Which makes you wonder, Jesus is giving out free food. A lot of people are rocking up, okay? It's a fantastic gathering. What could go wrong? How on earth were there so many people? What did Jesus do that was so significant that after he fed them, he said a couple of things and they just kind of walked away? They kind of walked. They didn't even come back for the, for the, for the pudding afterwards, okay? The second part is, on this context, so Jesus is feeding the 5,000. Then it speaks about Jesus walking on the water. So there's this second miracle element taking place within this context of the scripture. And it's fantastic. And now I am keep on wondering, what is behind this conspiracy theory element the whole time? Okay, it's not really a conspiracy, but I'm just dramatizing the situation that's taking place. So Jesus feeding, miracle taking place. Jesus walking on the water because what happened is where he was feeding them was on this coastal area. And he crossed over to the other side, obviously walking on water. And if you don't believe this, it's fine. There's a lot of stuff stuff that's really difficult to believe in the Bible, okay? It's called miracles, okay? Any case, so these, these weird stuff is happening. Jesus crosses to the other side, and now I'm going to tell you what Jesus said that caused a lot of people to walk away from him. Are you guys ready? Are you guys, do I have your attention? It's going to start off good, and it's going to end differently than what you expected. It starts off with as it says, I am the bread of life. That's fine. We can listen to the sermon, right? It's normal. Everyone is comfortable. And now Jesus comes and he slightly tunes it up just a little bit, okay? And he says, your fathers ate manna in the wilderness. Next one. And they died. Okay. Maybe not the best intro to a sermon part, okay? I am the bread of life. And by the way, these guys that you admire... These guys that you are quoting their scriptures from, these guys that you are reading about and following, they ate stuff from heaven. But guess what? They passed away. They died, okay? Not, not a good way to kind of address these icons. And now, now it kind of picks up pace. The, second, the next verse, it carries on and says, This is the bread that comes down from heaven so that one may eat of it and not die. Okay? Fantastic. But what is this? What is this bread? Okay? Jesus carries on. And explains it a little step further. Okay, He says, I am the living bread. It's still okay, right? 
that came down from heaven, if anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. And the bread that I, okay, just, just pause there, eats the bread, he will live forever. We can still handle that, okay? It still makes sense, but now the atmosphere is going to change again, okay? Put the egg on. Cold one. Go back quickly for me, okay? Just go back for me. I want them to get in their face. And the bread that I will give for, for um, that will give for the life of the world is my flesh. We know the end of the story. Ladies and gentlemen, if you do not know the end of the story, and someone tells you that my flesh is the living bread that's going to save the world, it's going to make you confused slightly, okay? This is a little bit of an odd conversation, okay? And now, immediately the author in the Bible writes what the people are thinking. And they say this, the Jews then disputed the people, they remember we, it's a lot of people, disputed among themselves saying, how can this man give us flesh to eat? He's preaching cannibalism. Okay, now, let me explain, no really, this is what they are talking, this is what stands in your Bible, okay? You can imagine why people walked away from Jesus if they were thinking he's talking about taking a takeaway after he's done preaching, okay? It's, it's slightly odd. It doesn't make sense. But the thing is, what you need to understand is you need to understand the mindset of the person standing there. Jesus had this image of being the Messiah, right? So the Messiah was someone that was supposed to be victorious. The Messiah was someone that was supposed to take rulership, place Israel on the map, and change the world on behalf of God the Father in heaven, okay? So G the Messiah was this magnificent figure, but for some reason the terminology is to a place where Jesus is talking about sacrifice. Jesus is talking about losing. Jesus is talking about a brokenness in his body, and the idea of a ruler leading with big muscles does not compare with the idea of someone being sick and ill and laying on a deathbed. That's not the leader you want to follow. But yet, that's the image Jesus comes to present to the nation of Israel. And now they are battling with this terminology, okay? They are fighting in between each other because what weird stuff is Jesus preaching to us? Okay, carries on. So Jesus said to them, truly, truly, I say to you, I'll Sorry that I'm laughing. It's almost as if Jesus is almost being deliberate in this, okay? I can't help but read this. Um, I, don't, I don't mean to be disrespectful in any sense. I just mean that I can see Jesus pushing this agenda, okay? And he says, truly, truly, I say to you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood. Okay, man, now, you know, eating flesh in emergencies, we can still make that logic. But now drinking blood as well, okay? Now it's getting dodged, okay? So they didn't have movies. But the moment you talk about eating flesh, drinking blood, this was not allowed. In their culture, the, the blood was special. And now Jesus is the stuff that you must keep holy, you must keep separate from. The stuff that you need, if you touch blood and stuff, you must cleanse yourself. And now the Messiah of our people is saying, now we must drink this and his blood. Like, ah, it's not going to work. And they kind of just paused there. They tapped out and said, we are not following this guy. And Jesus lost many followers. But here's the thing that I want to grab your attention to. Okay? This is what I'm building up to. Their agenda influenced their discernment. I'm going to say this one more time. Their agenda influenced their discernment. Okay? I'm going to, I want you to write this down because I'm scared you're going to forget this because this is going to be the the unmentioned idea through this whole text, okay? Because the story starts off with Jesus feeding 5,000. It carries on where Jesus goes across the water and people are following him. And Jesus is testing their agenda to see why they are showing up. And Jesus explained this in the text because it's just broken down because it's different pieces. But I'm just trying to explain why Jesus... Why Jesus lost a lot of followers, and this is significant for us, okay? So again, I'm going to say this. Their agenda determined their discernment. In other words, the condition of their heart determined how they absorbed what Jesus was saying. And because they were mind, were fleshly focused on bread, because that was what their agenda was. They could not discern what Jesus was saying, because Jesus was speaking something that is spirit, but because their mind was flesh, they could not discern. And they took the words of Jesus and they 
discerned it based on why they were there, and they came to a conclusion that seems right to the eye, but is off to the spirit. You see, there's some things in church that you will not understand and grasp because you're sitting here in flesh. When you discern things based on fleshly elements, you can miss what God sometimes is doing. Because the Bible will always contrast the flesh and the spirit. And when you come with a fleshly agenda, if you come with a wrong agenda, you will always discern what is happening based on the agenda. And your discernment will be off. Because you already predetermined the answer. You always predetermined the answer. Isn't that how we do communication with each other? Isn't that how we speak to one another? You haven't even done explaining your story and I know what I'm going to answer. Not because I care about your story, because I've got to answer. Okay. And we just, it's, it's just, it's just us. It's us, it's you, it's me. This is how we do things, okay? And so now, this is what happens to the follower of Jesus. And in this passage, I'm just going to break this open. We're going to get to a couple of points. How much? I've got a couple of minutes left. There's a couple of points I want to add to you. Okay, so now, get this, okay? A lot of people left. Jesus was talking about this flesh and blood type of thing going crazy. For us today, we understand a little bit better because we know the end of the story. But Jesus explains something significant, and I want you to grab hold of this. Because if you can grasp this and apply this to your heart, your discernment in your life will change. You will begin to be able to see things different. Why? Because your agenda was fixed. So if we can fix the reason why you do what you do, your discernment will flow better. You guys are with me here? You guys are very quiet, okay? So it starts off in this passage. It says, so when the crowd saw, remember... Jesus feeding the 5,000, Jesus walking over the water, Jesus talking about I'm the bread of life, and now this weird part is taking place that we just talked about. And it says, so when the crowd saw that Jesus was not there where he fed the 5,000, nor his disciples, they, they themselves go in, got into the boats and went to Capernaum, if you want to say that in English, um, just Google it, seeking Jesus. The next part, and they say, when they found him on the other side of the sea, they said to him, Rabbi, when did you come here? In other words, where were you? When did you? Why were you hiding? Why were you running away? Listen carefully to the words that Jesus, are, Jesus is speaking because it, it, it explains to us why he said what he said. Listen carefully. Okay? He says, Jesus answered them, Truly, truly, I say to you, you are seeking me not because you saw signs, but because you ate your fill of the loaves. So Jesus discerns their agenda from the get-go. In other words, what Jesus is saying, says, you are here for me, but the fleshly me. You are here for me because I provided bread to you. You are here for me because there's something you can get from me that benefits you. You are here for me for a personal agenda. You are not here for the signs of the Messiah. You are not here for the conviction of the Messiah. You are not even here to follow the Messiah. You are here to follow the loaves of bread. And this, this overflows in the conversation where when Jesus talks about this is my flesh, they don't want to eat his flesh. They want physical bread for free that they can eat. But now when Jesus talks about sacrifice, when he talks about following, when he talks about changing the inside, they are not interested in this. And they struggle to discern what he's saying because they're looking for something that they can physically eat to nourish the body. Now Jesus carries on and he says, Do not work for the food that perishes, but for the food that endures to eternal life, which the Son of Man will give to you. For on him God the Father has set his seal. In other words, what he's trying to say is, you guys are putting in this effort to come and follow me, okay? But you are working for things like food that can perish. It lasts a short amount of time. But it's important to have discussions about the things that matters in the end. Because you will invest into something, into relationships. I mean, you can take this in finances. You can take this in property. You can take this in education. And as the added to that, you can take this in your spiritual walk as well. There's stuff that you can spend your time on today that will have value later on. But the bread that you eat now will last a short amount of time. And it's materialistic elements. Okay, so you're following the Messiah for the wrong agenda. Okay, it carries on. And then Jesus says, for the bread of God is he who comes down from heaven. 
and gives life to the world. And so what Jesus did when he was talking about their fathers and manna in the wilderness, he's basically comparing his journey to the exodus of the Israelites in the wilderness. And God supplied manna for them to sustain their materialistic body. But Jesus is playing on that idea and explaining to him that the bread that is coming down from heaven now is not so much a materialistic bread, but it's a bread that will make the inside alive. It is a bread that will make your relationship with God alive. And this is what Jesus is explaining. And now, they initially started off positively, okay? But you guys, I just explained to you how this ends. So they said this. They said, so sir... Give us this bread always, okay? So they were kind of slowly engaging, but because their agenda was missing, it kind of ended in that weird space where they walked away, where Jesus was discussing this. Look at the next verse quickly. Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me shall not hunger, and whoever believes in me shall never thirst. But I want you to get something in this whole narrative that's explained. Jesus is presenting himself as bread to people but they missed this because when they approached jesus their agenda was this what can we get out of the deal but i want to warn you right here right now today when you engage with god when you follow jesus it's never going to be about what you can get uh, can get out the deal it's going to focus on what you can give out the deal so i want to tell you now it might seem like a bad investment, ladies and gentlemen. But when we talk about following Jesus, this is not a quick fix thing that we are signing up for. This is not a pyramid scheme where we sign, we give a 10 rand and we get a 100 rand. Ladies and gentlemen, you, many of you know, we sit in church today, okay, not because we want to use God, but because we want to be, be used by God. And if you come sitting here in church and think church people like us and some of you seated here, we are simple, we are crazy, we follow fantasies. Ladies and gentlemen, I am not here for what I can get. I am here because of what I can give because that's the example that Jesus set. If we want to change the world, we will need to give more than what we get out of it. And not everyone is ready for that. Not everyone is ready for that. So, Jesus speaks about this whole idea. If you're confused about cow and the flower, where that pops in, don't worry. I've got a lot to say in seven minutes for you. Okay. I want to take out three points about this idea of bread. Three points. Okay. Number one, you need to need. If you're Afrikaans, it doesn't mean you're asking for money twice. Okay. When I say you need to need, you moet die dier werk. Okay, so what is need in Afrikaans? Knie, knie. Okay, it doesn't. Knie to knie. Okay, you need, you need to need. Do you need, you need to need? Okay, again, <laughs> I've got a degree. It's fantastic. You don't have to applause for this. Okay, the the idea is to work it, to work it. When Jesus comes and he says, "I am the bread of life," I need you to understand that this is not going to be an instant solution. This is not something. There's some money. I'm going to be blessed. That's not how the walk with Jesus works. I need you to know that you need to need. You need to work your relationship with God. You need to. It takes effort. It takes time. It's not a comfortable journey because God will change your life. And I know we like the idea, but we don't like the process. We all want to be healthy, but nobody wants to eat the salad. And I get you, ladies and gentlemen. Sometimes health is overrated. Okay, any case. So, I just want to explain to you that this journey, it's, it's not a thing where you're going to sit here and just consume something, okay? The idea is you're going to show up and you're going to work the bread that will benefit other people around you. Why? Because that's, what's Je that's what it means to follow Jesus. That is how church works. I think we've got a, we've got a, a, a wrong perspective of church. We've got a comfortable perspective of church. But the heartbeat of God is to empty himself for the benefit of his children. You know what I'm talking about? 
when it comes to your kids. Jy is nie lis verschrik, weet kyk nie, but you will watch it one more time for your children. You're not lis to go sit by the pool to ask my wife or my mom to do it on my behalf. You are not, you, it's going to be sacrifice, it's going to cost something. You know what it means to do that for your kids, but we can't do that for other people. Here's the, the most challenging thing about church. When you join the church, when you follow Jesus, God is going to request of you to sacrifice of yourself for the benefit of people around you and you won't even like half of them. You need to need the bread of life. There's a work progress. There's no, can't be passive. It's an active element taking place. The second thing, and we like this one, bread is for regular consumption. Man, ladies and gentlemen, bread daily, it's manna from heaven, okay? Not brown bread, though. We don't talk about that. Jesus is soft, fresh, white bread out of the oven, okay? No seeds, no raisins, no cheese, no cinnamon, no poppy, I don't know. Tiny poppy is okay on the bread, okay? But the seeds, is it? I don't know, when you smile, it doesn't work. It just doesn't work, okay? Just, just, just keep the, it's fine like that, okay? It's fine, it's fine, okay? But you need to be aware that bread, and this is where I want to touch on something, okay? Bread, the concept of bread, it's regular consumption, okay? So I just want to quickly, uh, you, can put on, you can put on the next one for me. So we're talking about the idea of persistence. So where in the heavens does this do not, uh, the do not theology, well, I just said it. It's a, I want to talk to you about the do not theology, okay? So, Donut is something you're not supposed to consume with donut every day, okay? Not suck I hunt. I know you are here, okay? I know, <laughs> I know. You know, when you drive past the shop, you accidentally stop, you know? You accidentally buy two donuts. And when you go home, because you wanted to buy your wife one, and then you just throw the box away before you go into the home because accidentally slipped and the other one also fell <laughs> into your stuff. You guys know what I'm talking about, okay? You guys know what The thing is, that we take something that is for special occasions, like a donut. But we tend to consume that every single day. Okay? It becomes unhealthy. But here's the thing. The idea of a donut is special occasions. Okay? The ideas of a donut is special occasions. But for some reason, we treat our relationship with God that way. We treat Him like special occasions. But yet Jesus comes and he says, I am bread of, I'm not the donut of life, okay? I'm not that special occasions of life. I'm not that for a funeral at life. I'm not that for a wedding of life. I'm there as bread, which means it's a daily consumption progress. It's a consistency. There's a persistence that takes place in this relationship when it comes to God. And this is why I'm referring this title as the, the donut theology. And I want to add this, is that we, we study God as a donut on special occasions. But the reality is you do not do theology that way, okay? So that's why I'm referring to you, do not do the donut theology, okay? But there is power in the flower. There is power in the flower. There is power in this idea that we treat Jesus like bread. There's health when we treat Jesus like bread. There is there's change when we treat Jesus like bread. There's persistence. So instead of using Jesus as a once-off special occasion with a, with a candle in that we're celebrating and singing, we need to exchange the donut theology for the bread theology and have him on a persistent basis in a healthy manner. Because that is what sustains our spiritual life. The third thing that I want to leave with you is this. It's simple but significant. Man, I do not know about you guys. Do not. Do not. I'm the type of guy that, man, I know we can go eat by nice places. Okay? There's fantastic places out there. But there's something that hits a little bit different when you get home in the afternoon. And there's a fresh slice of bread. Now just bear with me here for a second, okay? Leave the margarine, okay? You hide the real butter from your family and from your kids. You've got your own special drawer, and you have that real salted butter that comes. I'm not talking about the, I'm talking about the real ones. There's something, ladies and gentlemen, that hits a little bit different than something as simple as a slice of bread. It may be simple, but I know so many people 
that they will die for a fresh piece of warm bread. It's something that is so common. It's something that is so simple, but yet it's something that's so significant. Come on, I know you guys. When you guys, when you guys go to Ocean Basket, Man, you're not even there for the fish. You're only there for the rolls. I know exactly. I know exactly what you guys are doing. They think they've got a fish business. They've got a bread business, ladies and gentlemen. Any case, any case, any case. But I just want you to, to be aware of something that is simple, simple. The, the elements of Jesus, bread being something that's simple, but do not underestimate the significance of something that is so everyday, something that is so we are so used. To, you know what happens in church? We get comfortable with the blessings that we enjoy. And we come to church and we say, Ah, oh, it's And we come to, Ah, oh, it's just bread again and just bread again. Until the bread is lacking in your life. And then you tend to miss the significance of the simplicity of the ideas that Jesus brings. Never underestimate the small thing. Never underestimate attendance. Never underestimate good manners. Never underestimate, underestimate a genuine prayer with few words. Never underestimate being obedient when God speaks. Never underestimate using bread. It's simple, but yet it can become so significant. So I want to conclude with this, with my banner. The donut theology. Do not use God as a cake, as a donut, as a special occasion thing. But when we look at Jesus, we are supposed to use him as bread on a daily basis. There is power. <laughs> There's power in the flour. There's power in the flour. It's, it's not a donut thing. So I want to encourage you. If this message is moving your heart, and if you feel the Spirit speaking to you, respond to this. I'm not going to ask you to run forward and pray and all this thing. It's, it's, it's a decision on the inside that you need to do. It's, it's very, very simple. So I want to encourage you. If you feel the Spirit is speaking to you today, don't you want to respond to His call? You see, for many of us, this can be old news because we, we've been seated here for a long time. But it can happen that when we become so used to this process, we begin to neglect the value of the bread of life. We become spoiled. So even for you that's, that's been on this process for a long time, I want to encourage you, do not forget the significance of the healthy habits that you've built into your life. You've been doing it so long, you don't even realize the blessing. You know? Sometimes, I'm, I'm taking, if I can take a, a silly example. Let's say you've been walking, if I'm taking a, a materialistic physical example. You've been walking two kilometers every morning for the last six months. Fantastic. It might seem like ah, nothing for you until you stop for six months. And you want to try getting back into the habit of Then you mean, man. Remember when I thought I was so bored with walking? I wish I can walk that fast again. You know? Some people can't even walk. Some people can't walk around the block because their health won't allow that. There's so many blessings built into these healthy, small little habits. Keep holding on to those healthy habits. Showing up is healthy. Spending time in prayer is healthy. Reading your Bible is healthy. Listening to a sermon is healthy. Praying for someone else is, is healthy. Never underestimate the value of Jesus being this daily bread in our lives that we get to share with others. So I want to encourage you to do two things. Two things. Step number one. I want you to join us Wednesday that's coming around the corner this Wednesday. We're going to have a day of prayer and fasting. Now the moment I say fasting, you guys are getting bleak and normal already. Okay? So if, you, if you don't want to fast, it's fine. Just show up Wednesday evening from 7 to 8. We're going to have a dedicated worship evening on Wednesday. We want to encourage you to fast, but if you can't, it's up to you. Come to service Wednesday evening, and the idea is we're going to schedule one hour where we're just going to pray to God. The worship team is going to be ready. We're going to have the setup a little bit different in church for Wednesday evening. 
But don't you want to buy some time out? Don't you want to apply this message to your life and come join us as we seek God's face for Wednesday evening? And then the second thing that I want to encourage you is, if you're in the area, if you don't go to any other church, show up next Sunday, 9 o'clock. It is our Vision Sunday. We want to share a couple of important things for you. But in irrespective of the Vision Sunday, I want to encourage you to build in the daily bread habit into your life. Not because I am saying this is good. Because Jesus said that he is the bread of life. And whoever comes and eats of him and drinks of him, whoever applies this to their lives, their lives will be, their lives will be changed. I want to tell you this. God can change your life. God can change your life. It's not because of this platform. It's not because of this person. It's not because of a banner or icon. But when God does something in your life, He can change things around. So I want to encourage you. Just show up. And I want to say this to you. Allow God to make a change in your life. Allow God to work in your life. This is not a, a stage thing. This is a spiritual relationship. And all we are extending is this space. We are going to gather together as a church to worship. And you guys are welcome to jump in with us as we spend time with God. Let's pray together. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for your faithfulness, Father. My prayer is that this message will be planted in people's hearts, that it will produce fruit, Father. I'm praying for courage for anyone who's here that's listening to this word and is feeling a little bit unsure. Father, you are faithful. You are speaking to them. You are knocking at their door, Father. My prayer is that they would have the courage to respond, Father. We dedicate our hearts to you. We pray for this year. We pray for the unseen that's lying ahead forward for us, Father. And we just want to say we want to walk this journey with you, Father. Thank you for always being faithful in our lives, Father. Pray that in Jesus' wonderful name and everyone says, Amen. Thank you.